Good morning, it's lovely to join you for worship uh, this morning. Uh, thanks too for inviting me to be part of uh, this series of fruitfulness uh, on the front line. Uh, and this morning we're going to consider uh, the subject of moulding culture. Uh, I found the, the title fascinating uh, because it assumes uh, that we have a shape uh, that is different to society. Uh, and I just wish that was always the case. But if, if I'm honest, I'm not trying to be negative here, but I am trying to be honest um, that I think when I look at my own life and when I look at um, uh, those that I've been leading over many, many years, uh, it's a struggle sometimes uh, to be distinctive and to be different. I came across this quote and I share it with you. Uh, it's an ouch quote, uh, but I share it because I think it's worth pondering on. It says Christians use of money, priorities of time, attitudes about work and leisure, divorce and remarriage, increasingly reflect culture rather than scripture. Therefore the church is weak in skills and weak in character. For the last 30 years I've been doing my best uh, to lead myself, my family and the churches that I lead um, in uh, following God's ways rather than uh, to allow society to shape us into their ways. Uh, the following verses will be familiar to you. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like the way the message puts it. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And how about this from J.B. Phillips? Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mould. I don't know about you, uh, but I find it massively challenging uh, to be this distinctive person that Christ uh, wants me to be. Uh, yesterday I went out for a cycle. I've been trying to get out for a cycle most days and uh, I must be honest I was doing incredibly well yesterday as I was going downhill and the wind behind me and then I turned a corner and as I turned the corner a wind hit me that made me feel as if I was on stop or going backwards uh, and then I came across a hill. Honestly I'm sure there was a hedgehog that passed me on one occasion. Difficult. Trying to be a Christian in society is a bit like riding a bike up a hill and into a gale. I wonder if you can relate to what I'm saying. But our friends at LICC don't want us to survive. Uh, they want us to take ground. They want us to mould society. Incredibly positive. Um, why would they encourage us to do such things? Because that's what Jesus encourages us to do. Have a look at these verses with me. In Matthew 5 it says, You are the salt of the earth. <laughs> you are the light of the world. Incredible statements. And this morning we'll only have time to look at the first. You are the salt of of the earth. What do we know about salt? Well the first thing is that salt enables life. Uh, salt, salt has a, a really bad press these days but without salt we can't live. Um, that became very clear to us some years back now when our nephew was involved uh, in a race. Uh, he does something called Ironman uh, which is like a triathlon on steroids why anyone would ever want to do uh, an Ironman I have no idea but he loves them he's gone all over the world and on this one occasion he was um, out in the Canary Islands and uh, he'd uh, done his swim two and a bit miles or whatever it is um, he'd done his hundred and odd miles cycle and now he was doing the last leg the marathon and as he was telling me he, he said um, he, he said, Unc, he calls me Unc, he said, Unc, he said, I was taking on so much water. He said, I was taking on so much water. But then he collapsed by the side of the road and uh, his, his life actually was in danger. And the medical team were fabulous who, who looked after him. And what they said was that while he was topping up with water, 
he just wasn't getting enough salts into him. Salt enables life. But salt is also a, a preservative. Our calling is to stop society from going bad because that's what salt did with food before the invention of uh, fridges. And when I think about people who um, affected society for good, my mind instinctively goes back to people like Wilberforce, uh, who had such a dramatic impact for good uh, on the slave trade. Uh, I think of the Earl of Shaftesbury and the impact that he had on the workplace. Uh, I was reading that even just before um, the birth of the 20th century, children as young as four and five years of age were working in our factories, 12 to 14 hour shifts. And through the endeavours of a man like that, uh, that stopped. And then I came across a, a man called Robert uh, Rakes, uh, a man that you may not have heard of, um, but he was influential in opening up Sunday schools. And these schools not only taught uh, the children about the love of Jesus and the ways of Jesus, they taught them how to read and how to write. Uh, and schooling across uh, the nation was birthed out of that movement. We can think of many more uh, examples. But salt is a preservative. Salt also makes you thirsty. Uh, do you remember when they used to put nuts, peanuts uh, on the bar? The reason they did that is that they wanted you to drink more. And there should be something in us. There should be something in our character uh, that our people are attracted to come back to us again and again because they find life, they find vitality uh, within us. Salt also adds flavour. When food is bland, people add salt. We should add flavour wherever uh, we go. I, I do believe that um, even without saying a word, people should recognise something different in us, different in the right sense. That there should be something attractive, something that adds flavour um, wherever uh, we go. So let me just summarise that. You are the salt of the earth. We are to be people who give life, people who affect society for good, people who add flavour and create thirst, people who in the right way spice up life. That is some calling. So a couple of observations. Salt has all of those qualities but it's no good unless it's added. My nephew was in trouble not because of salt but because of the lack of it. This world will not be impacted until we the salt of the earth get cl up close and personal with a world that desperately needs salt. George MacLeod writes, I simply argue that the cross should be raised at the centre of the marketplace as well as the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on the town's garbage heap, at a crossroad so cosmopolitan they had to write his title in Hebrew and Latin and Greek, at the kind of place cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble. Because of that is where he died, that is what he died for, and that is what he died about. That is where the church ought to be, and what the church ought to be about. We have to be amongst the people. But the second observation is that it's really important that we stay salty. In Matthew 5.13 we read, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Uh, I like the way the message puts this. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavours of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, 
How will people taste godliness? I learnt years ago that the only way that I can emit light or to add flavour uh, is to hang out with Jesus. Uh, because on my own, I easily run out of puff. Let me just give you another uh, cycling illustration, if I may. Uh, I was out for a little pedal, and um, I, I'm pretty good on the flat, but when it comes to the hills, I slow down rather a lot. Uh, and this was a particularly nasty hill. And honestly, I looked at my speedo and I was doing three and a half mile an hour. That half mile an hour was quite important to me uh, because it was more than three. Uh, and my goal was to try and get to four. Well, anyway, as I was struggling up this hill, all of a sudden, whizzing past me uh, were two people on bikes. Uh, they zoomed past me. <laughs> I'm feeling a little deflated when the one in the front said, Sorry, we're cheating. They're electric bikes. And I chuckled to myself and I thought, What a great advert for an electric bike. They were able to get up that hill because they were relying on a power other than themselves. <laughs> and I've learned years ago through many, many mistakes and many failures that unless I spend time and go back to the source of the power of the sanctification that Christ wants in me, <laughs> I've got no chance. I, I've, I've discovered that uh, my power battery is about that big and I, and I, can, I can start off with gusto but I, I easily run out of power. So it's critical for us to go back to the source. Funnily enough, um, in my quiet time this morning I, I read these two verses from John chapter 5. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. A little later, in verse 30, he says, just to emphasise, by myself, I can do nothing. And that was Jesus talking. If Jesus had to be totally reliant on the Father and on the Spirit, how much more so for us? But you know, I, I find great encouragement in that because in my younger Christian life, I actually felt that I just needed to try harder and harder and harder. But actually, what Jesus revealed to me is I just need to get closer and closer and closer to him. So I make it a priority every day now. The first thing I do is I go and spend time with my Lord and my Saviour, the one that I love, because I know that unless he empowers me, I can't add flavour. I can't emit light. I want to um, uh, bring this little talk uh, to a close uh, with um, a story I heard uh, some years ago now uh, and it was a, of a Cherokee Indian talking to his grandchild and he talked about life and he talked about it in these terms that within every person there are two wolves uh, one is evil and, uh, and one is good uh, the evil is full of arrogance and pride and is rude it's full of ego and the second wolf is full of the qualities that we read about in Scripture, about the fruitfulness of joy and peace and love and kindness. And, and the little child said, um, so, so, so which, which of the wolves wins? <laughs> and the granddad looked at the child and said, um, well, the one you feed. I found that hugely challenging. And it reminds me again about the importance of feeding in the right place. Of allowing God's word to nourish me.
to allow my mind and my thinking to be shaped by Christ's righteousness. Thank you for allowing me to uh, be with you uh, this morning. You are the salt of the earth. You are people who are called to affect society for good, to add flavour and create thirst. People who in the right way spice up life. And we do that by being people who spend time with Jesus.